Turkey, Iraq, Afghanistan, the terror continues. A rocket attack today on the Kabul Hotel where Helen Clark stayed recently while visiting New Zealand troops. The main Kiwi contingent is in Bamiyan, about 200 kilometres west of Kabul. But tonight we travel with an even smaller and more isolated group of New Zealand forces in Afghanistan. They're manning a remote firebase in rugged territory ruled by warlords, guns and money, opium money. Dawn's light breaking high over the backbone of central Afghanistan, the soaring Hindu Kush. Already they're out on the road up at Firebase Romero. This is no drill. They're locked and loaded. Romero is the farthest flung deployment of New Zealand's defence force in this utterly foreign land. Well, it's pretty rough, but uh, it beats living under a uh, piece of nylon out in the field, and uh, we actually quite like it here. Major Ben uh, Green, bit, uh... he and his men are up on patrol for three weeks. Hurricane lamps, primus stoves, no showers. It's pretty basic. She looks a bit... Uh... A bit muddy today, but it's the first day, first day of change uh, coming into winter. But it's uh, quite a close environment. We've got a good team, and uh, it's just typical Kiwi attitude of making what's uh, what's bad better. So, what's the plan for today? <coughs> okay, today's plan. We've got two tasks. Uh, first one being up to this village here. Looks simple on the map. It's anything but. The only crop worth growing here is opium. That's paying for the private armies of the two warlords who lay claim to either end of the valley. You know that some people you're dealing with have, have links, and some openly tell you that they were Talibs, but uh, you know, it's a case of the devil you know, and you keep your friends, your enemies closer, and your friends near. You're supping with the devil? In some cases, yeah. And for that, you need a pretty long spoon? A very long spoon, and a metal one, preferably. This place, Duabi, is nicknamed Tombstone, and for a very good reason. It's got more than a touch of the Wild West about it. Just a few days before we arrived in, a policeman was shot, not by some renegade, but by a fellow policeman. This is all part of an ongoing power struggle for control of the region. Uh, we're just really trying to find out ourselves and where everyone stacks up in the whole situation. The Sword of Islam is the law on the street. Opium pays the bills. This is the main road north to the markets of Europe and beyond. Warlords levy tax on every truck passing through. This is uh, Mullah, um, Mullah Rahim. I'm not sure of his background, but he's sort of quite an amicable sort of guy. looks after us when we come in here. Mullah Rahim's stronghold dominates the main street sees everything, misses nothing. Just a case of the whole country, you never know who you can trust her. And where are his allegiances? Where do they lie? Well, I'd be speculating, but I'd say that uh, both sides of the fence. Convivial and conniving by turns, the wily Mullah Rahim is all things to everybody. Yeah, sort of dealing with uh, feudalism, warlordism, uh, the intricacies of local politics, and it's a very complicated myriad of things to put together. The alliances are changing. Uh, it's very difficult to track who's, who's sided with who. At least Mullah Rahim is prepared to parley with his foreign visitors. A short distance away is the squat, sullen village of Shasafit. No schools, just three mosques. It's pro-Taliban and home to one of four renegade mullahs in the district. Is it frustrating sometimes? You know things are going on, you know you can sort them out, but you can't. Uh, we're not a general combat force as such, so um, you know, there's some things we can get involved in and help with, but uh, others which are beyond our means. 
desks made from old plywood offcuts, second-hand carpets. What they can and do get involved with is helping the boys and girls school at Marder. Tell them to um, please to study hard and then they can be anything they want to be when they grow up. Larry Cohen is the U.S. Special Advisor for the province. USAID distributes millions of school books nationwide. The projects that we've seen over the course of the last 12 to 24 months have had a tremendous, uh, made a tremendous difference in people's lives. As the primary aid donor here, what are your concerns? Our ability to really manage the, the disposal of funds, the dispersal of funds to make sure that it gets to the right uh, to the right communities. It's going to take quite a, quite an effort, and we really have very few people on the ground to do this. That a school like this for boys and girls is up and running at all is beyond price here. Illiteracy is a blight on Afghanistan. 90% neither read nor write. During the lost years when the Taliban ruled, the headmaster tells me, studies were mostly limited to religion and for boys only. Can you tell him I'm just going to put some, some water, some cool water onto his eye? Okay. It'll help with the irritation. Outside, Sergeant Kirk Bloomers, the medic, deals with an unexpected emergency. We'll give him some antibiotics. He's had some analgesia. He's been blinded by a blow to the eye. Pressure's building behind it. Without hospital care, he'll die. I just want to call the eye. All Sergeant Bloomers can really offer, though, is comfort. The New Zealand contingent is ready for battle. They're formidably equipped. The four and a half ton armoured Humvees are on loan from the US military. The 50 calibers pack quite a punch. But the rules of engagement mean our troops can't go in with guns blazing. Can't get involved in faction fighting. Technically can't intervene if they see human rights abuses. And they can't stop drugs production. Uh, I understand that uh, a kilo of, uh, of opium, uh, raw opium, uh, grown by a farmer here can earn up to 11,000 Afghani. The equivalent of about five, $550. Uh, for a small plot of land that grows maybe seven kilos. That's a huge, huge income for a farmer uh, compared to other crops that he would grow. Poppies are farmers only dependable source of income and account for half of Afghanistan's GDP, an estimated 2.5 billion US dollars. Warlords fund their armies and private interests off the proceeds and America condones the warlords. The situation on the ground here is that you, you have a, a, um, a structure that hasn't really changed much over the course of the last thousand years, and you have strong men who run the, run the situation. Uh, but these are the very same warlords that stand accused of abduction, for ransom, abuse of children, girls and boys. These are, these are not the kinds of people that you and I would want to have as friends. So how can you do business with these people? Well, realistically, there's no other choice. There's no, really no other power structure here to do business with. Doing business with the warlords. The patrol is traveling deep into the command valley this morning to meet with the new district sub-governor. There's been quite a drama unfolding here in the past few days. The local police chief and his unpopular boss were removed from office. They didn't go quietly, uplifting 50 Kalashnikovs, ammunition and police uniforms. Just introduce uh, Larry as the member of the State Department. The man from the State Department is determined to lay down the ground rules for the new district strongman, General Tufon. Now, as, as district governor in your new job, you're also responsible for enforcement of laws and trying to control this, uh, uh, this cultivation. Well, that's the official line, but Larry Cohen knows that opium cultivation pays wages for the local militias. The reality is that no one, not the Americans, certainly not President Karzai back in Kabul, is willing or able to stop it. The people who are cultivating poppy 
uh, really do not have much of an alternative right now to, uh, to poppy cultivation because it earns them so much money. Back at the fire base, the main fight is with the elements, isolation and at times boredom. Doing battle with the bandits and the warlords is not part of the brief. They're here in trying conditions to provide a measure of security, gather intelligence, win some hearts and minds along the way, and to stay clear of trouble. Most of the guys here have been on previous missions before, to either be Timor, Bosnia. In the unlikely event that you discover Osama bin Laden is in your district, what are you going to do? Be on the radio. Yeah, there's not much I can do myself. It's, uh, he wouldn't be travelling by himself, so... He would be calling in for the, uh, the big players in the, in the effort. You wouldn't take him on? No. <laughs> no. What they are taking on are local projects, and the locals are grateful. Even this, music and dance. It was all banned by the Taliban. That's what tonight's feast's all about. Pilau rice, curried mutton, Coca-Cola, an expression of gratitude. The patrol's only here for a few weeks, no guarantees after that. That'll depend on the winter and the level of threat. Maybe it's not much, but in a community with almost nothing, it means the world. Does it feel like you're actually making a difference locally? Yes, it does. Um, we've certainly been able to embed ourselves in a community here, whether it's assisting with um, the Siding of a Well project or dealing with uh, factional disputes in the area. You know, we, we are seen as a person who can make a difference. Back home, tearful farewells out of Christchurch yesterday as more New Zealand Defence Force personnel left for Bamiyan. They'll be relieving some of the troops there. Up next, more tears, tension and trauma in the elite sport of dressage.